Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, I hope you're having a lovely weekend. Let's talk about the combat system in VMS D&D. Um, I'm not going to talk about any of the magic spells yet. I haven't quite gotten through documenting all of them. Um, so they'll be in a different video, but there's plenty here anyway. This is gonna, this may be kind of a doozy of a video uh, compared to some of the others. Um, you may want to use the bathroom and grab another beer before we start. I don't know. Uh, so anyway, when we enter combat, so okay, I should say first that um, in VMS D and D, uh, all different, um, different game functions are encapsulated within these different basic modules, okay? So, like, um, when you're moving around the dungeon, um, execution is happening inside this new dungeon module, and when you, um, when you're interacting with a special feature, um, it, the, uh, uh, execution switches into this other module, and when you are dealing with treasure, it switches into this other module, and when you're in combat, it switches into this other module, and that's, um, the, the, the modules all have their own, like, line numbering scheme. Um, VMS Basic is a fairly advanced basic. This was a compiled basic, um, not like, uh, much more advanced than, like, the Microsoft Basic that you may be used to using on, like, the Apple II or the Commodore 64 or any of the other 8-bit platforms. I think all of them other than the TRS-80 like the very first release of the TRS-80 used its own basic, and I think the Atari 8-bits used their own basic. Uh, but all the rest of them used Microsoft basic. So if that's what you're used to, this is a very different basic. I mean, it's still basic, but it's, um, it's, it's, uh, it's a much more serious basic. Um, very featureful. It's actually, I mean, it's still basic, so it's still brain dead, because that's how basic is. But it's, as far as basics go, it's like, on the higher end of the scale, you know what I'm saying? So anyway, uh, I'm digressing already, and we haven't even started. I haven't even had any tasty beverages yet today either, other than my morning coffee. What's wrong with me? Chatty, chatty, chatty. Chatty Kathy. I'll have to change my name. Okay, so, when we enter combat, um, the, uh, the different modules that we were just talking about transfer information between themselves um, through a couple of entries in the character record, okay? And the character record is contained in this 64 element array, which is documented here, okay? It's just a, the C array. And um, a lot of the entries are never used, and some of them are set but never referenced, and... Um, uh, it's it's very strange, but in any case, these last two these last two uh, entries in this uh, character um, character record uh, are used to transfer information between um, the different modules, as well as to track what state we're in um, in the module that we are executing within. Because you know, like a there, there's there's like this um there's like this uh over there's there's a there's a loop that runs that contains that branches to whichever module we're we're in right and um the 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 state uh the state the module can have several different states that it can be in um the combat module um doesn't act like this but in in any case um this this sixty fourth uh, entry here is what um, is what we're using to pass, uh, or the sixty third one. I'm sorry, I'm full of shit. The sixty third entry here, the scratch variable, is used to pass uh, optional data into the combat module when it is entered, and um, that is used by various dungeon special features like the throne. Um, and the Dragon Lair, and, uh, some other stuff that I can't remember off of the top of my head, to, um, to, to, to summon, um, specific special monsters, um, 
based on how the player has interacted with those dungeon special features. All right. So th this is uh, this is what happens um, when we uh, when we start. So um, if C sixty three is set, um, it'll be set to uh, the number of the special feature that is. Uh, wanting to summon a special monster and then since this is basic it uses a bunch of uh, go-to's so it skips over this whole choosing a random monster part um, and uh, goes straight down here to uh, uh, where did I put it oh I moved all of that stuff into the uh, oh, Jesus Christ <laughs> oh yeah, I moved um I moved all of that special monster data into uh my documentation of the special features. That's right. So um we have to skip around here a little bit. We talked about that in a previous video though. Uh so like the um I won't go through all this, you can watch the previous video, but um when you uh fart around with the Dwarven throne it's possible that a dwarf lord will be summoned and um uh, when you desecrate an altar, it can summon a demon prince, and when you run into a dragon's lair or a dragon guarding the orb, uh, then it'll summon a dragon lord. And those are all documented in the special features um, uh, documentation there, but, which, by the way, you can get all of this um, and fart around with it yourself through the subversion repository. I know, I know it's not Git, but I've got like 20 or 30 years worth of code well, 20 years of code in subversion repositories that I've been self-hosting for that long, and I like to self-host my stuff, so I'm going to keep using it. So, sorry. You can access it through a web browser, though. If you go to uh, ocfco.net, my fancy, fancy pro web page, um, down at the bottom of that page, there's a link into the subversion repository, and you can either fart around in your browser, or you can check it out um, with a subversion client, uh, whatever. Anyway, so... It's, uh, if, if necessary, it, it, uh, it, it, so, it uh, sets the monster that the player is going to be fighting to that special monster based on what the dungeon special feature wanted to summon. Otherwise, it chooses a random monster off of the monster tables. And um, if you recall the monster tables, um, there is a section at the beginning that encompasses all of the undead, and then there is a section that encompasses all of the things that aren't undead. So it rolls a 20-sided die, um, and then uh, depending on whether it's chosen undead or not undead, it uh, it weights that result so as to make um, the lower, the, the less dangerous monsters more common uh, within, within that subgroup, I think, is how it's working. Um, as you can see, there's a lot, there are a lot of numbers here, and I am just a dumb, dirty hick living in a shack with some old computers, and I am quite frankly too lazy to look into that too much, because when I rewrite this, one of the things that I want to do is um, link the random encounter tables to the particular dungeon level, um, so we can have um, dungeon levels that are a little more themed and uh, additional monsters eventually and stuff like that uh, once we start expanding the game past um, the, like, mostly direct port. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, that's that's how that works. And then, um, if recall uh, from the uh, from the monster table, there's a, there's a minimum dungeon level and a maximum dungeon level that each uh, type of monster can appear on. And if it's chosen uh, a monster that cannot exist, um, on the dungeon level that the player is currently occupying after going through all of this stuff, then it just starts over entirely, like completely entirely, um, and rolls an entirely new monster encounter. All right. But otherwise, we go ahead, we uh, look on the monster table, we look up the monster's name, um, we look up the monster's, l we calculate the monster's level, um, which is based on the dungeon level that the player happens to be on and uh, a little bit of randomness. So um, lower dungeon levels will tend to have 
Um, I mean, deeper dungeon levels, I should say, not lower numbered, but deeper dungeon levels will tend to have more powerful monsters in them. Um, and if the monster level um, is too low, because see, there, it's monsters, certain of these monsters have a minimum level, like you can't have a dragon that's below level 8, right? If the monster level that's been uh, calculated here is too low, then once again it starts all over and rolls an entirely new random encounter, and it'll just keep doing that until it rolls one that's valid, alright? Then, uh, it calculates the monster's uh, strength, that is how much damage it does in combat, um, based on its hit dice, it's it's random. Uh, you'll you'll encounter like weaker and stronger monsters, but it's just a, a random number between one and the monster's total number of hit dice. Recall the hit dice um, of the monster table that we talked about in that other video the other day. Um, and then it calculates the monster's armor factor uh, based on the monster's level, and that's also a random value uh, from um, zero to one less than the monster's level. Alright, uh, and then there's some funny shitty code here, uh, and I don't know what some of this is doing, and it doesn't appear to do anything later, so I don't know what's up with that. Um, and then there's, this is an interesting section. I never have encountered this um, in the PC version of the game. Maybe, maybe uh, I'm just, I, I don't know, I guess it doesn't exist in the PC version of the game, but apparently here in the, uh, in the VMS version, and, um, I think, I think I have had this happen in the Unix version, although I haven't played the Unix version nearly as much as the DOS version. Um, but apparently, um, if the, uh, if the monster is way more powerful than the character, player character is, um, there's a chance that the monster will just knock you out, uh, subtracting some hit points, or uh, having your current hit points instead of just killing you outright, um, and then and not kill you. Uh, so that's I guess that's kind of to maybe make it a little uh, a little easier for low level characters who have fallen down through pits onto lower dungeon levels, deeper dungeon levels to um, to survive and get back to a dungeon level that's more appropriate for them to be playing on. I don't know, but it's it's based on the player's charisma, which. Um, which is interesting. So there is actually a use for the charisma stat. Hmm, fascinating. There, it's it's used some other places too, uh, uh, for with some of the monster special abilities um, that we talked about the other day. Anyway, so um, if uh, if the monster just doesn't knock the player out and go away, then we calculate the monster's hit points. Um, it's uh, a number of dice. Uh, equal to the monster's level that we uh, figure that we rolled on up here, and the size of the dice is, of course, the monster's hit die, um, as uh, as as we looked up in the monster table. So if we had a you know a level uh, level three goblin, it would roll three dice with three sides each and total that up, and that would be the number of hit points that the monster has. We uh, tell the player what they've encountered, and there's a cheat flag uh, as part of the character record that we can turn on. It um, It's not really a cheat flag, it's more like a debug flag. It, it just prints some extra information, uh, debugging information. And now, um, if, uh, if the player has the silence spell active on himself, um, it gives him a greater chance to uh, get the first attack. Um, otherwise, uh, we roll a 20-sided die based on the character's uh, intelligence and dexterity, and if uh, if that roll is successful, then the player gets to go first. Otherwise, the monster gets to go first. So um, we'll just assume that the player gets to go first here, because uh, that's the order it is in the code. So um, the player gets prompted for what he wants to do. If you're um, if you're a fighter, you don't get this cast option in this string, um, but you can still select it. Uh, which is interesting. Uh, in the PC version, you can pick up wands uh, that actually allow fighters to cast spells. Um, they don't regenerate spells over time like um, magicians and clerics do, uh, but they can l just like bank these wands and use these spells that they get uh, whenever they want. And that um, that really unbalances the game, in my opinion. In the VMS version, um, fighters just can't cast spells. They can't uh, they can't pick up wands at all. I don't. Th 
think. You know, um, I haven't, I haven't gone through the treasure module yet, so I may be full of shit. I may be leading you astray here. Um, but uh, no, based on based on this code, fighters can't cast spells. Period. In this version, in the in the PC version, you can though. Anyway, so if uh, the player tries to evade combat, then um, there is a uh, nine in ten chance that the computer says evade in response to this, otherwise uh, run away, which I guess is a Monty Python reference and I thought was a little bit amusing. So, um, then there's a nasty block of code here that um, looks at the surrounding walls and decides whether the room is completely closed in or not. And if it is completely closed in, um, the player is told that there's nowhere to go, and it skips over his turn, the rest of his turn, and the monster attacks him. Now, um, it's interesting to mention that uh, according to uh, Justin Rancourt's old webpage from the 90s that discussed this game, uh, the PC version of the game, the original PC version of the game, um, not uh, Dungeons of the Necromancer's Domain, but the direct Pascal port of Lawrence's D&D, um, had, had a bug here, uh, and maybe the bug exists in this code too, since it's since it was supposedly a direct port of the Pascal version, um, where uh, this didn't actually work right. Uh, but I have never actually um, played the VMS version of the game. I've never gone to the trouble of trying to get SimH running and run it off of one of those disk images that I've got. Which, uh, that's something that I need to do for historical purposes, but... I seem to always have better things to do than that. But in any case, um, this does check to make sure that you can actually evade. Um, and then it rolls uh, 2d10. Not a d20, but 2d10 against the player's decks. Um, and uh, to s see whether or not the player can evade. Now, also, if the player has a magic cloak, um, this adds another chance for the player to evade. So the um, the player gets two chances based on their dexterity throw and their um, magical cloak is what it looks like, but basic. Very strange. So um, I think the, the language when um, you fail to evade is uh, disconcerting. Um, when the when the game says you're rooted to the spot, that sounds like you're like rooted by magic and can't move whatsoever to me. So that's a little funny. I think we ought to change that in the rewrite. I just make you fail. Just tell tell the player you fail to evade and skip right to the monster attack. Um, otherwise, um, if that these two uh, die rolls. Um, oh, now that's interesting. Oh, never mind. I'm full of shit. I was looking at it cross-eyed. Yeah, uh, so, um, if the player does manage to evade, then, um, a random direction, a random valid direction is chosen, and the player is moved into that new position. I didn't bother to go through this code, because, uh, might as well just rewrite it my own way, uh, when we do the, uh, when we do the rewrite, because C and BASIC are very different languages. Um, the structure of this code will have to change dramatically um, for it to work in C, because uh, we're not going to be having spaghetti go-to shit all around. So, just saying, you know, like, I haven't... Th this stuff that's, you know, fairly procedurally obvious, I haven't, uh, I haven't converted into plain text. Anyway... So that's that's how evade works. If the player decides to fight, um, then then uh, the uh, chance to hit is calculated based on this lovely formula, um, which uh, undoubtedly Lawrence um, spent a great deal of time balancing. Um, That's a heck of a formula. But apparently it worked. Anyway, so it, it calculates a percentage chance, and then it throws a 100-sided die um, against that percentage. And uh, if, uh, if the throw fails, then you missed. And um, it, part of this throw is based on how many, how, how many hit points down you are, how much you've, your character's been wounded. And um, 
if uh, if you missed because of that, then it tells you so. You missed because uh, because you're hurt, and um, it skips the rest of your round, and the monster goes and attacks. Otherwise, then we hit, and uh, we uh, we go into this section. We calculate the damage um, that the player does. It's it's partially random, but the um, the size of the die, the number of sides on the die that is rolled, is based on the um, character's class. So, um, a uh, magician whose class number is 2 um, would be rolling a 4-sided die, a cleric will be rolling a 6-sided die, and a fighter will be rolling an 8-sided die there. Um, to, to determine damage, but then the uh, magical weapons uh, plus level is added to that. And once you get higher up in the game, um, you, and you're using like plus 20 swords and shit like that, the actual random part of this doesn't make so much difference. So um, in the higher level game, um, it turns out that uh, magicians, you know, are almost as like the level of effectiveness in just combat is much more even at the much higher levels uh, than it is at the low levels which is which is uh, which is interesting um, you'd think that you'd kind of want it mechanically to be opposite from that um, so that like low level squishy magicians uh, have a little bit easier time surviving until they are, are actually survivable you know and then um, after that the uh, special abilities of the class would diverge more, like the magician would get progressively shittier at combat and stronger at spells, you know what I'm saying, whereas the fighter having no spells would get progressively stronger at combat, but the way this ends up working isn't like that. Um, that was a beef uh, that I have with the original game too, so when we start to extend the game and um, replace all of this with like a uh, BX-ish type Thaco and uh, armor class system and make it a little more like um, uh, basic D&D was. Um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll change some of that. Um, and it's, it's worth noting that this, this formula here is, I mean, that's, has, that's nothing like what's in white box D&D either. So um, this, this is entirely Lawrence's invention. Um, this doesn't have anything to do with uh, TSR's um, white box D&D, which was a set of expansion rules for a tabletop miniatures war game um, to allow, like, single heroes to fight alongside, like, groups of troops. Uh, and then it, like, evolved into the Dungeons & Dragons that we know today. Um, anyway, uh, I, I have digressed again. I, I apologize. Um, so anyway, uh, we calculate uh, the weapon damage, and then um, we either add add to that strength if the uh, character happens to be exceptionally strong, or we subtract from that if the character happens to be uh, especially weak. And uh, I seem to recall that... Um, Yeah, okay, never mind, I'm full of shit. Uh, and uh, then the monster's armor deducts from that damage twice. Um, there was uh, a little bit of documentation in the source code here indicating that um, it's once for its armor and once for its shield is why it's deducted twice. And I, I assume that's done to make the, uh, the, the combat um, even between balanced between the, 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 the player character and the monsters. Um, the monsters don't have separate shield and armor stats like the uh, player character does, so I guess it just uses this one twice. And if the damage gets reduced uh, to zero or less, then um, the attack fails and uh, it goes on to the monster's attack. Otherwise, we apply some damage, and if, uh, if the monster is dead, then we... Uh, Assi then we uh, assign monster XP and um, set some of these sort of scratch variables that we talked about and branch to the uh, treasure module to um, 
give the player some loot uh, from the monster. And, um, and that's the end of the combat. Uh, otherwise, if the monster is still alive, we go on to the monster's attack. And um, dragons have a 10% chance to breathe fire. And uh, the fire damage that they do is equal to 2d20, quite significant, plus uh, the dragon's level. And the player character is given a saving throw um, to reduce that damage by half, uh, which is very D&D-ish. Um, if, uh, if the monster isn't a dragon and decides not to breathe fire, then it does a normal attack. Um, and uh, the uh, monster's chance to hit is calculated on a very similar formula uh, to the player's. Uh, so the combat is balanced there um, fairly well, as far as I can tell. And uh, a hundred-sided die is thrown, uh, the same as it was with the player, and it can miss due to its weakened condition, um, the same as the player could. And uh, otherwise, the monster, the monster hits the player. And uh, then we have, we have to apply some special abilities here, uh, based on what the monster is. Now, uh, high-level undead, the Wraith, the Spectre, and the Vampire... Um, have a chance to drain a level from the character, which is, oh god, it's it's painful. Um, drains an entire experience level. Ugh, I hate it. Um, but anyway, there's a chance for that to happen um, that's modified by what if the uh, player character has um, protective spells engaged there. Um, and so uh, if there's an energy level drained, then it happens, and it goes on and applies damage after that. Um, so, we, then we apply the damage. Um, we roll the damage, I should say. Um, and uh, the amount of damage that uh, the monster does, the size of the die that it rolls for damage, is equal to its hit die from the monster table, recall. So, a dragon will be doing a d20 of damage, which is pretty hardcore. And... Uh, uh, it also adds its level, so a level 20 dragon would be doing uh, d20 plus 20, which is a lot. Um, anywho, and then, if the monster is a Balrog, it has two separate weapons, a sword and a whip. It uh, randomly determines which one it uses. It uses its sword 75% of the time, but 25% of the time it will strike with its whip, which does one and a half times damage to the player character. Ouchie. Balrogs suck. I think they're harder than dragons, personally. Anyway, um, then uh, then the damage gets reduced by the uh, player's shield, uh, very similar to how um, the uh, damage to the monster was getting reduced up above. Um, and uh, if uh, if you if if, uh, if if the shield blocks all of the damage, then that's it. That's that. Otherwise, um, we. Uh, reduce the amount of damage based on the player character's armor. And um, fighters and clerics and magicians have different innate levels of armor, so I guess it's assuming that um, a warrior goes into the dungeon with plate mail, a cleric's wearing chain, and a magician's wearing nothing. So um, warriors have the best armor class, uh, clerics have the mid-range armor class, and the magicians have the worst armor class. Uh, and so... If the, the, the character's armor um, reduces the damage to nothing, then that's that. Otherwise, we apply the damage to the character, and if the character has been reduced to zero hit points or less, then that's that. The end. Game over, man. Etc. Um, otherwise, the character is still... Um, alive, and we continue and process some of the monster special abilities. So if the monster is a doppelganger, uh, based on the character's intelligence, there's a possibility that it can look like the character and confuse them into losing their next attack round. And uh, I forgot to remove that when I was doing this. All right. Um, otherwise, if the monster is a harpy, it can try to uh, charm you with a harpy song. Uh, the chances of that succeeding are based on your wisdom score. 
and um, if uh, if the special ability is successful, then you lose your next attack the same way. It's just uh, the same. It's the same effect, but it's based on different uh, stats on the character. And um, this doesn't happen every round with these monsters. There's a one in four chance it appears. Uh, no, there's a one in four chance for the doppelganger to do its thing, and it appears that there is a two in three chance for the harpy to do her thing. Um, but I think that may be an error on my part. I'll have to check that later and see. Uh, I don't want to waste time in the video with that. Anyway, so that's how uh, that's how the combat round works. Um, after the monster finishes it attack, its attack here, it um, it loops back around to the top and prompts the player again, assuming that the player is getting another turn and hasn't been, you know, fucked up by. Uh, some of these special abilities or something, and uh, it just keeps uh, it just keeps going through the combat loop. Now, um, if the uh, character chooses to cast a spell, um, if the character is a fighter, you can't cast spells. Um, uh, and there's some stuff here that I don't fully get, uh, but we'll. Um, I'll figure that out some other time. So yeah, um, you're asked to cast a spell. It prompts you for the spell level and the number of the spell uh, within that spell level. Recall the uh, the spell list. Oh, maybe we haven't looked at the spell list. We'll look at the spell list in another video and discuss what all of the spells do. But um, magic users have uh, six spells per level and four different spell levels, and clerics have four spells per level uh, and uh, four different spell levels, so we'll, we'll look at the spells and what they do in um, in a different video, though. But anyway, if uh, the when, you, when the player chooses to cast a spell, it just uh, prompts for what spell uh, you want to cast, and it deducts from the number of spells of that particular spell level remaining to be cast, and that value uh, gradually re regenerates over time. Um, as you like explore the dungeon or wait or whatever and um then it uh it processes the the spell based on um a bunch of other stuff that we'll discuss later based on its its spell effect and that's that's the that's it for that then it goes back to the uh um regular combat round all right so um when you kill the monsters it assigns you some experience points uh based on the monster's hit dice, the monster's level, and the random strength and armor factors that were rolled for that particular instance of the monster. And it appears that um, as the character level increases, um, you earn less experience points uh, for monsters. So... I'll I'll have to look. I haven't looked at the um, formula that it calculates spells or uh, experience points needed per character level. Um, but uh, the way this is written leads me to believe that it's probably flat, um, and we're just assigning less experience um, as the character levels higher instead of requiring more experience points to go up a level. I don't know. This is kind of funny. It's it's different than the way that uh, BXD and D does it. Um, so it it awards the experience points and to the character then, and um, then it uh, checks to see if the character went up a level. We'll look at that code later. Um, now, um, if the character dies uh, during the combat round, it branches to this 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 death procedure. And um, if uh, if the character is a cleric and has uh, any level 4 spells remaining, the Raise Dead spell is a level 4 spell, then it tries um, to, like, self-cast that, which is a little funny. I don't, if Monster knocks you out, I don't know how you can, like, cast a Raise Dead spell on yourself as you're dying, but that's the way this game does it, I guess, since you don't have parties of multiple characters, which is another extension that I'd like to make to the game once we get the work alike done and start expand, expounding upon it. Um, I'd like to have, like, multi-character parties and multi-monster parties. I think that would be interesting. Anyway, um, if that, uh, if, if the, it, it tries to raise dead if, 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 if it can, if, if you're a cleric and you can, uh, otherwise you die and it deletes your character record. Now, um, 
when uh, when you're a cleric and it uh, tries to self-raise from the dead when you die, um, it deducts one of the level 4 spells, automatically casts the spell when you die, and um, it reduces your constitution score. Uh, and rolls a 10-sided die against your constitution. Now, that doesn't... I must have accidentally deleted something in here. It's supposed to reduce your constitution score. makes me wonder how many other errors I've made in here. I was probably deleting a block of basic code as I documented it and accidentally deleted the line where it reduces your constitution. So, yeah, when uh, when it tries to self-raise, your constitution score goes down by one. Um, if your constitution reaches zero, you can't, you can't be raised. Um, otherwise, it throws a d10 against your new constitution score. And... Um, if that throw succeeds, then you're raised with a random number of hit points between 1 and your maximum, um, and your constitution is reduced by a point. Um, so that's how and the game continues. Um, I think the, uh, the monster magically disappears when this happens, as I recall. Uh, yeah. I'll have to check that too. Um, anyway, that's how that works. Um, it uh, if you die, it prompts whether you want to reroll another character or quit. And uh, if you quit, then it says farewell, brave sire, and ends the game. Otherwise, it branches to the character creation stuff. Um, and uh, here is the code that checks to see whether the uh, player character uh, gained or lost a level. Um, based on their experience point value and this is called um, this is called at the end of combat it's called um, when uh, various dungeon special features like the fountain um, add or remove experience points and uh, it's called when you exit the dungeon and your loot that you've found on this trip is converted into experience points and um, it either uh, gives you a level or doesn't or does nothing if you haven't gained or lost a level and um, f fixes your hit points based on your gained or lost level and fixes your number of spells remaining based on your gained or lost level and uh, this is the code that calculates the number of spells per spell level that uh, you have based on your character level and um, there's not really anything to say about that it's just it calculates it rather than looking it up on a table like one would do in BXD and D. Anyway, uh, that's that's how the combat system in VMS D and D works. It's um it's a little janky some places, but uh I guess it's a classic. Um I think when we do our rewrite at first, uh, our remake, I'll probably um try to faithfully reproduce the um, the uh, fancy fancy complicated formulas and uh, make it a genuine workalike. Um, but one of the very first things that I want to do when we start extending the game is to um, replace all of this with an OSR uh, combat mechanic um, out of some retro clone tabletop D and D alike, like um, Dark Dungeons, for example, is pretty much a direct clone of uh, the Rule Cyclopedia version of Basic D and D, or the uh, the five book um, box sets that came out after BX D and D. Um, and it's it's worth noting that um, the uh, these retro clone tabletop games that I want to uh, I want to borrow the mechanics out of them instead of out of um, uh, actual TSR D&D &D because even the mechanics are the same um, but the, the text is kind of open source that's what the open game li license is all about um, but part of the um, part of the licensing agreement it's kind of like the GPL for text is what the open game license is but part of that license is that um, the text has to be in a um, human readable format so um, I can't legally directly copy like 
sections out of an OSR tabletop role-playing game and paste them into a computer game um, and compile it because then it's not human readable. But the thing is um, that, that, that copyrights apply to textual works like that. Um, patents apply to mechanics like game mechanics, formulas and shit like that, not copyrights. So as far as my legal understanding of the OSR goes, um, I can um, use the mechanics out of, say, the Dark Dungeons game um, in a rewrite, but all of, like, the um, spell descriptions and stuff must be in accompanying human-readable documentation. They can't be embedded uh, directly in the source code, which is fine, because if we're planning to target, like, 8-bit microcomputers anyway, um, we'll have to have all of that in separate documentation anyhow, because, I mean, there's no way you could compile all of that text into the game um, and have it not waste all of your disk space or something, right? Uh, even Ultima 3, you know, like, all those spells were in the manual and there was no description of them in the game. Um, and I think that's how all the rest of them were, just because the, um, I mean, it's a 140k disk, you can't put, uh, volumes and volumes of documentation on that. Uh, anyhow, or, anyhow, uh, right, so, I'm digressing again. That's the combat system for VMS d and and some thoughts on how to make it better, or at least different, um, when we get a little further on the re-implementation. I hope you've enjoyed uh, yourself, or at least haven't fallen asleep, unless that's what you were meaning to do, in which case, sweet dreams. Um, like I said, you can, you can get all of this code and documentation that I've been working on out of the Subversion repository, which is linked to from the website ocfco.net, which is a palindrome and it, and, and tickles me. Um, and uh, I hope uh, I hope I'll see you next time. Have a lovely weekend.